I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and it's time to get wealthy. You're going to learn exactly what you need to do to finally achieve the level of financial success you desire and you deserve. What does it take to actually build a successful business? Black businesses are starting businesses at one of the fastest rates ever. However, if you look at the statistics, what you'll find is that many of those businesses are only making an average of $45,000 in revenues a year and are solo owned. So what does it take to really scale a business, make it viable and actually have a team? Well, here's what you may not know about what it takes to start a successful business. And the truth is that getting financing when you don't have revenues from a traditional bank is difficult. In addition to that, most businesses get funded by family and friends. So what do you do if you don't have any friends with deep pockets? However, one of the alternative ways to actually get capital for your business is something called crowdfunding. And that's exactly where we're gonna start today with our conversation with our guest today. Both her and her husband started a business initially from their kitchen table. It was a do-it-yourself hair care kit. And they eventually grew that business to over a million dollars in sales. And one of the ways they were able to scale that business and get access to capital was through equity crowdfunding. And so that's the conversation we're gonna to have today. So I wanna welcome one of those co-founders of Listener Brands, also known from her product Curl Mix, Kim Lewis, to Get Wealthy today. Welcome to Get Wealthy, Kim. Deborah, thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see you. Well, it's good to see you because I can remember us on the hunt for capital to build our business uh, many years ago. And now to see the level of success that you've been able to achieve, uh, it's so inspiring. And I wanted to have this conversation with you because I believe it's going to inspire our audience as well. Now, we have a framework for financial success on our Get Wealthy program. It's called Mindset, Strategy, and Execution. So that's exactly where I want to begin with you today. And it's the mindset question. Now, I remember you struggling with this little hair care kit, do-it-yourself kit, and you weren't making a lot of revenues. What kind of mindset shift did you have to make in order to go from you know, maybe, maybe six figures to that seven figure target? Uh, that's a great question, Deborah. You know, a lot of people, myself included, start businesses because they hate their job or they hate their boss. And honestly, I think that's one of the worst reasons to start a business. Um, you should start a business because your product is needed in the world, not because uh, it, it, you hate the person that you work with. If you hate your job and you hate your business, you know, your manager, go find a new job, a place that makes you feel comfortable. Um, and I say that because starting a business is truly a um, labor of uh, love and service. You are a servant first and foremost in everything you do. And originally when I started the do-it-yourself box, it was because I wanted to see, you know, a DIY kit in the market because I it would have helped me when I was going to Whole Foods, spending hundreds of dollars on raw materials, coming home, watching YouTube videos, making something and not liking it. And something like I waste hundreds of dollars and this box would have helped me save money. However, my customer was still buying products, you know, at the store every day or online or still buying ready-made products. And this was just kind of novelty and not necessity for her. And when I realized that, I was like, you know, I need to make things that people want to see in the market and that they're willing to pay for, not things that I necessarily want to see in the market. Um, and that shift helped me be open to feedback from my customers, to want to hear what they have to say, to you know be bold enough to have a Facebook group where I can read their opinions about my brand every single day. Um, and that mindset shift, I think, really propelled us to that first million dollar year. But making things that only I want to see in the market kind of kept us at the low six figures. 
Mm, so just because it's something that you like doesn't mean it's something that the world is going to like. Like, and so you gave us a, a sense of sort of where the idea from the business for the business came from, and that was your own needs. And typically, that's you know the problem we're trying to solve is something that you, you, we're experiencing ourselves. But you said something really interesting there, and it was about listening to your customers. So for our audience, what did that mean for you to actually identify, okay, they may not want this, let me try something else? One of the things we did early on that's free um, and very cheap for a lot of founders to do, but most people do still don't do it even when they have brands making hundreds of millions of dollars, is have a Facebook group for them. After people are, you know, after they purchase, they get added to our list and then we um, send them to our Facebook group. And in there, and early on, you know, we maybe only had like a couple hundred people in the group and we would let them vote on kits that we were launching or we would get their feedback if they liked something, if they hated something, if they loved something. And we would post polls every week. Oh, what's your favorite oil? What's your favorite butter? Do you do wash and goes? Do you do braid outs? You know, what's your favorite place to watch a movie? Uh, you know, all those kinds of things. And then we would respond to them. So after they would vote, we would literally change our business to accommodate that vote if it had enough respondents. So sometimes in that group, we'll get, you know, now we have about, I want to say 16,000 customers in the group. And if it has, if a vote has like five or 600 people, and I'll give you an example. We have this subscription box within our company called Curl Mix Fresh. And in Chrome Express, we essentially let people, um, we have a new product every month at one point. And it was like actually three to four new products every month. And it got to the point where it was too much product for some of our best customers. And we voted and said, hey, you guys, do you want to switch Chrome Express to quarterly? And I think it had maybe 600 votes. This was like last summer or last Q4. And they were like, yes, we would love it if Chrome Express was quarterly. Um, but they wanted it quarterly at the same price. It was like, ah, I can't do that, but we can make it quarterly. <laughs> we can make it quarterly. <laughs> um, and so overall, it ended up being cheaper for them because it, it was more expensive than monthly, but it was cheaper than if you had gotten the box all three quarters. And those are the kind of changes we make in the business based on their responses in that Facebook group, which is free. And most people, you know, don't have that part. So I do want our audience to understand that your your business, like your so so you shifted from this do-it-yourself kit, and now your company is the the product that we're talking about right now is curl mix, right? And so just share with our audience what curl mix is and what problems the those brands solve. So Curlmix is a company where we help you master your curls in 21 days or our product is free. So what do I mean by free? We'll get store credit if you don't like it. And our primary product is a four-step system to help women get this hairstyle. It's like a wash and go. Um, it's for um, a black woman over 40 who wants to have a signature look, who wants to look the same when she goes on a date, uh, to church, to dinner, uh, a soccer game for her kids or basketball game. Um, but she wants to wear, you know, use natural products. She wants it to be healthy for her hair. She doesn't want to wear extensions or weaves. Um, and she's trying to, you know, kind of get her hair to look more fuller and thick. And that is who our customer is and who we serve at Chromix. But Chromix is That's one it. brand. Sorry, go ahead, Deborah. No, no, go ahead. I want you to finish. But Chromix is one brand of the conglomerate that we're building. So we're hoping to, we're building a direct to consumer Procter & Gamble type of business. So Procter & Gamble owns always maxi pads and Old Spice and um, you know deodorant, soaps, toothpaste, all those things of hundreds of products. And they're traded on the stock market. And my goal for my company is to be traded on the stock market one day. We're not yet, but um, crowdfunding gave me a bit of a taste of that. And so I wanna do that. So we own all of our own manufacturing, we're vertically integrated. We hire black and brown people um, from the south and west sides of Chicago, and we pay them starting at $19 an hour. And Chromex is just one of the many brands that we're going to build. We have Chromex and 4C only, and hopefully we'll launch more brands in the future. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted people to know that you broadened that scope, you know, from that, you, that kit to now a brand. And brand means many products within that brand. And, and I believe you already gave us some insight into 
the 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 name of your brand is now listener brands and you share that you've been listening to customers so is that where the brand was derived from the name yes we make brands that listen and when i say listen people will say well how do you know how your customers feel and most people are doing like a survey you know every year to get feedback from their customers i literally log into facebook and see what they they think every single day because I am in the Facebook groups and we have community managers. We spend more time in our Facebook groups than we do on Instagram. And so the name for our holding company or our conglomerate, you know, I realized like, what do we do? We make brands and overlook segments of the market. We make brands that listen to its customers. And so Chromix came from that, from me listening um, in those Facebook groups about what people actually wanted versus the DIY box. And the same with 4C only. We, the number one comment on all of our uh, ads was like, but this doesn't work for 4C hair. And I realized that the 4C women wasn't celebrated, even though everyone in our industry knows they convert and spend more money than everyone else, but no one was willing to put them on the front of the marketing, on the bottle, on the label. And so we went ahead and did that. And, and we listened to an overlooked segment of the market. And so that's what Listener Brands does. It makes brands that listen. That's interesting that you say that 4C, and I want you to explain to our audience, what is 4C hair and why you focusing on it and put it, it putting it at the forefront of your marketing is so important. So there's this, now the hair types, I mean, they don't necessarily, they matter, but they are not, they don't matter, right? Like, so, they matter in the sense of you want to be able to figure out who has hair similar to yours, but it isn't something that you should live and die by, right? It's it's something that you just, oh, this is a tool that I can use sometimes. And essentially what it is, is 4C hair is, um, hair is on a spectrum, right? Um, the person who created this model basically says that hair has, you know, type one, two, three, and four. And then in every type, there's a level A, B, and C. And type one is straight hair, type four is coily kinky hair. Um, but type four is the coiliest, coiliest, kinkiest hair um, and the tightest, right? So, if, you know, if you're like your Afro in its natural state, um, if it's really, really tightly coiled, really, really kinky, then we call that 4C hair. And what we find is that a lot of the marketing kind of skips to the middle where the person has like loosely coiled hair and she's curly, but like the truth of the matter is most of us do not look like that, especially black women. And so 4C was, is usually just kind of lumped in there with everybody else but their hair is very, very different. Um, think of like um, Lupita or uh, Viola Davis, like they have like 4C hair. And so what we wanted to do was put them at the forefront without manipulating their hair, without making it look like it's straight or look like it's wavy, letting it live in its 4C glory uh, and celebrating them on the website. So when they come to the website, they see a woman with 4C hair, not someone who has like you know, loosely coiled or you know whatever kind of texture. And so that is what 4C hair is. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go there, but, you know, like so, so often what we were, what we thought was like good hair, you know, that was curly, that wasn't kinky. So you may not go there, but I'm going to go there because that really is, you, you know, the point of the ma the fact of the matter is that so often what is depicted in uh, media or marketing is what is considered idea from a uh from a, a totally non out of the culture perspective I, the only other question i have for you is is i want to make sure people understand you created a uh sort of product for 4c hair but i know in someone that's used your product but even in the curl mix family there's still a uh product that i can use in curl mix Certainly there, you know, you have different uh, products for different types of hair, but I just wanted to clarify that with you. Yeah, so Chromix is a much bigger brand than 4C Only. 4C Only has about four to five products available. Uh, Chromix, we have like over a hundred probably. We have a few different kits to help you get a wash and go. So Chromix is a four step system to help women get this hairstyle. But we also offer other things like twist out creams and Chromix Fresh. We have and Chrome Express is our category where we have a ton of other products where there's like a little face, a little body, um, but mostly here there are protein treatments, there are um, color waxes, there are like all kinds of things in Chrome Express. So we, Chrome Express is a much bigger company than 4C only, um, but 4C only is only a year old. So uh, hope, we're hoping to grow it and scale it just like we did with Chrome Express. 
Well, I'm glad you said scale because that is the next uh, uh, part of the conversation that I want to uh, kind of get into. And that is, we talked about mindset and the fact that you had to move from just making things that you that you think you want and really begin to listen to your customers and create products that are gonna solve their problems because that's what they're gonna spend money on. When we come back, I really wanna talk more specifically about strategy and how you were able to get the financing and the funding to scale uh, Chromix. So folks, don't come go anywhere. When we come back, we just talked about mindset. Next, we're gonna talk about strategy and how she was able to go from that kitchen table to what we call in the business cap tables when you get funding for, for your business. So don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back. Let's be honest. As successful women, we're crushing it. Maxed out 401k and Roth IRA? Check. Aggressive savings and investments? Check. Yet, the freedom our success was supposed to buy can leave us stuck on the six-figure hamster wheel, watching retirement slip further down the road. There's another way. Get coaching courses and community at WealthyU.com. Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape. With me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and today we're talking about how to build and scale a successful business. And so often, it's always the money that prevents us from being able to go to the next level. So my conversation today is with Kim Lewis. She is co-founder of Listener Brands. We've been talking about her, how she took her one product or brand, Curl Mix, and grew that to over a million dollars in sales. Uh, Kim, thank you so much for coming on and kind of sharing your story. Now I want to get to strategy. And I know that uh, it's so, as a business owner myself, we met pitching out there, pitching for dollars. And I, I want you to share with our audience a little bit about, so you scaled to a million. Did that give you the capital to keep scaling or, or did you uh, confront any kind of obstacles to prevent that? People always think getting to, you know, seven figures is the goal as an entrepreneur. And I, it's a great goal. And when I, you know, that day that we hit seven figures for the year, it was like December 31st, it was like the very like last day of the year. And while I was ecstatic, I was still broke. Like we had a bunch of loans. <laughs> we had a bunch of loans. All my people were contractors. We could not afford um, to, you know, me and my husband were sharing 60K annually. And back then, you know, my husband had quit his tech job where he was making multiple six figures on his own. You know, so for us to be sharing 60K annually was like not enough because we had a mortgage that was like a few thousand dollars. So um, we were like, we didn't have much money. And it took me raising my first million in venture, in, in venture capital or really angel investors, right? Venture is more like institution backed. Angel is more like wealthy individuals. And um, that money would actually gave us the money that we needed to actually scale the business. But when we had made our first million, we didn't have much. So, so now talk about, because I think that it's important for our, our audience to know, we, you know, you go on social media, you hear all of this, you get to seven figures, but top line and bottom line are two different things, right? Whether or not you're in the black and just because you have sales doesn't necessarily mean that you have the profits, you know, to, you know, coincide with that. And sometimes you've got to run at a negative. So I know that uh, you and your, your husband decided to launch a crowdfunding an equity crowdfunding campaign. So explain to our our audience why you chose to go that route to get to to get more money and 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 exactly what equity crowdfunding is. 
Yes. And before I touch on that, Deborah, I'm going to definitely go deep in the equity crowdfunding piece. But I would love for your listeners to, to just sh- I would love to share with them that we manufacture our own products. And that's special because most people are, are, are ordering like, you know, their products from China, whether it be fashion or skincare, makeup or whatever. They're ordering from China. They're paying, you know, you know, I don't know, a dollar or less sometimes for their raw materials or the actual product that they're buying. And then they're selling it for like 20 or so here in the States, maybe 50, depending on a skincare item. Um, they're paying maybe a few bucks per item. And, you know, those jobs are over in China. Um, and, you know, your people, they're not employing people here in the United States. There's nothing wrong with that form of business, right? And this is not me knocking anyone for doing that because you got to do what you got to do sometimes to get the business off the ground. Um, we decided to make flaxseed gel. Flaxseed gel was our number one selling box as a DIY company. And literally the flax seeds that you might put in a smoothie or that you would use as an egg substitute, when you boil them, it gives you a really gooey gel that helps you get this hairstyle. And when we went to manufacturers to make it, they all told us no. So we went to maybe three different manufacturers to get this made. And they all said no. And so we were like, okay, well, we're going to have to make it ourselves. And that basically, I spent maybe all of September when I was seven months pregnant in my kitchen making 50 different batches of flaxseed gel um, until I landed on something that people loved. One lady actually flagged me down on Michigan Avenue in Chicago to like figure out what was in my hair. And I'm like, man, we're in the street. Like we can get hit by a car. <laughs> but she's like, what, what did you do to your curls? And so, and from then we just decided to manufacture it and we pre uh, launched it to our audience. We did pre-orders and sold hours in a matter, I'm sorry, so hundreds in a matter of hours. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what people want. So that's when we pivoted the business in top of 2018 and did a million that year. And then the next year we were on Shark Tank and then we did about 5 million that year. And as you are building this business, so this is where the equity crowdfunding comes in, right? Manufacturing is capital intensive. You know, you are buying all the raw materials. You are buying the machinery. Sometimes the machinery, just like a mixer, sometimes it's like $15,000, you know, just to, to mix to have a mixer on hand. And then you need two in case one breaks and you're like, don't have another mixer, you can't make any product. On top of, you know, paying your team, right? If my payroll is, you know, $60,000, $70,000, I'm paying $30,000 alone in payroll tax for that payroll. And that's because I employ stateside, that's because I employ people in Illinois, Um, I employ people of color and I pay them a living wage. You know, minimum wage here is like what, $10, $12? That's poverty in in Chicago. And so I'm not willing to do that, especially not to my people. Uh, And so we start $19 an hour for our full-time employees. We offer 401k, healthcare, benefits, division, dental, et cetera. And in doing that, right, you manufacture, you pay people well, um, and you are growing very, very fast. That sometimes leads to lack of profit because essentially I'm not stealing profit from my workers, right? And so what does that mean? That means I have to go ahead and fund the business. I have to find money to be able to do these things in my business. And so I have to go and pitch venture capitalists and see if I can get an investment from them. Um, But I did that. I maybe spoke to about 30 VCs and they always wanted to see more. I was like, you know, we grew 500% on the 1 million that we raised. No one wants to invest. And they're just like, "Mm, we want to see more. But if the person who's writing the check on the other side of the table doesn't look like you, they're always going to need more to be convinced that you're the real deal. So I was like, you know what? I have 100,000 customers. I can raise my own investment. And that's when we had crowdfunded last year. We launched our campaign in April. And we ended up raising $4.5 million from about 7,000 investors. So that means people like me and you. Um, And equity crowdfunding is really important because before people like me, like people like, you know, non-wealthy individuals, they could not invest in private companies before they went public. That was only reserved for wealthy individuals, people who are, I would call like a rich, right? Making, you know, 250,000 more annually or having a net worth, I think it was like a million bucks or something like that. I might be getting the numbers wrong, but that's what it takes to be an accredited investor. And before this new law in 2012 called the Jobs Act, you could not participate in investing in an Uber or investing in a Facebook or investing in a Curl Mix or listener brands because the law just said you could not. Now with equity crowdfunding, it opens up the opportunity for anyone and you can invest up to 10% of your actual income into a, you know, uh, pre-IPO company. 
And I say pre-IPO means like, you know, a privately held um, small business. And so that's what we did. We raised 4.5 million from 7,000 investors. I, I want to say maybe 60-ish percent, which are our customers. And um, the other 40% are people who just were really inspired by what we were doing uh, and, you know, who found our campaign. No, I wanted you to explain it rather than I explain it because I feel like when 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 you can see what's happening in real time and and how you know you you just gave contact text and so the bottom line is is that in order to invest in a, a company like yours prior to the Jobs Act of 2012 you couldn't mm -hmm. unless you had uh, an income of two hundred thousand dollars if you're a single person or if you're a couple three hundred thousand dollars <laughs> you have a net worth right of two million dollars and you don't include your home which which for most african americans that's where most of their equity is in their personal res residence so really what the jobs act allowed was for you someone like you rather than having to go to these venture capital and as I've, I've pitched, pitched, pitched in two. And so I've collected so many no's at some point, I did the same thing you did, you know, uh, uh, but not with an equity uh, crowdfunding. But the point is you were able to raise up to $5 million and get give access to investors who typically are shut out. Uh, and what many people don't know is that it is in these early stage company where so many fortunes have been made, whether it's, uh, you know, people like uh, um, uh, a Reed Hoffman and who, it, it, based on what I know, invested in PayPal before they went public. So it's before, to your point, going public that the, the real risk is I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, you know, paint a picture of, you know, there's many, many fortunes to be made, you have to be willing to uh, lose what you invest, but the op opportunity for reward is much, much greater. So, so thank you for, for explaining that. And I, so, so did I hear right that 60% of your customers actually invested in the IPO? I mean, in the equity crowdfunding raise? As in our crowdfund, we had 7,000 investors, and I think we brought 83% of the investors to WeFunder, which meaning only 17% of the people who invested that were already on, they were already on WeFunder. And the other 83% we brought, and as far as uh, customers go, 60% of that was my customers. So they really believed in our product and really believed in what we were doing and wanted to have a piece of it. They could not believe that I was offering this to them. They were so excited. And, and I think you bring up something else interesting that our audience needs to understand. You hear about crowdfunding platforms. What what Kim just met, mentioned is WeFunder. You may have heard of like a Kickstarter, which really typically is rewards based where you're giving people some kind of benefit in order to invest in your company and you're not actually giving them equity. But for many, uh, I think there's sort of like this, uh, what do I wanna call it? A, uh, 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 a fable, if you will, that, oh, you just get on this platform and we're gonna give you exposure and you're gonna, you know, people are gonna automatically invest in your company. But what you just conveyed was the fact that you brought people to the table for WeFunder, which is an, uh, on the WeFunder equity platform. And you maybe got a little bit, but it was you who really drove those uh, investments into your company. Yeah, you know, I like to think of it as the platform is just the vehicle and that's all they're going to be. They are going to help you get your, you know, your landing page up there. They're going to help you with the legal of it, you know, do's and don'ts, um, point to different resources, you know, SEC attorneys, accountants, auditors, et cetera. Um, but they are not responsible for like raising your actual round. They are just meant to be a vehicle between you and the SEC. Right. Because you can't do your own crowdfund on your own platform. Um, it's technically illegal. So they're just meant to be the ones that are working on behalf of the SEC to allow you to raise this crowdfund. But it's still your responsibility to bring your actual crowd. So I usually don't recommend crowdfunding for people who are just starting their businesses. If you don't already have you know, a mailing list of 10, 20,000 people or more, crowdfunding is going to be very, very difficult for you. 
Absolutely. You know, you've got to have some kind of network already to leverage the platform itself. And of course, I think the fact that you had proof of concept, meaning your you know, revenue, people are buying your products and those people are happy uh, with it is brilliant. And that's exactly where I want to go next. And that is execution. So what you just heard is the shift that uh, Kim and her husband had to make to go from this sort of mom and pop business to actually scaling and employing people. And then the strategy that she used basically was to listen to her customers. But now let's really talk about, she did that crowdfunding campaign. I'm more interested in what that crowdfunding allowed her to do. And so when we come back, we're talking execution. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Kim Lewis, co-founder of Listener Brands with her husband, Tim Lewis, and them really sharing their story, her, her sharing her story about they've been how they've been able to scale that one little business that started at the kitchen table, if you will, into a multi-million dollar brand. And we just discussed how they have been able to get the funding to scale. And now, uh, Kim Lewis, welcome, welcome back. I mean, this is so fascinating. Uh, just the the way you're uh, giving a a a real insight look at what it you know the grit and the different ways that you've had to kind of you know flip the script, change it up in order to be successful. And so now I want to talk a little bit about strategy. Now you mentioned that you are running your business uh, with you, you know, more costly, right, to produce your goods because you're not what you described was basically white labeling, right? <laughs> Where someone is basically taking a product and putting their name on it and making it look at as if it is a true brand, but it's not something that they actually manufactured. Am I right there? That's what you were describing? Yes. Yes. And so, so uh, to that end, you talk a little bit about that you're making these products yourself, that, you know, the cost of goods sold, if, if you will, of, of, of manufacturing these products are, are much higher. So your margin, right, is lower because it's costing you more or your profit. Let me just talk in, you know, in just basic, you know, terms is uh, lower because your margins are higher. So I am, I mean, your because your costs are higher. So I'm really interested in what was your strategy? You, you did this crowdfunding campaign, you raised almost the maximum that you can in an equity crowdfunding campaign. What's your strategy for, for the use of that money? So one of it was to, I knew that this crowdfund was gonna be the bridge between my seed and my series A. So it was gonna be the thing that kind of helped propel me. I realized I didn't raise enough money in my seed round. Um, I had a million dollars. Tell, tell our tell our audience what a seed round is. So I, I'd love for you to just walk us through like, first I, it's my own money, you know, then I go out and get this and then I go, what, what, what did that, what does that path look like? So first I use my own credit cards. Um, I went into my own personal debt. Uh, for our business the first few years. And then shortly after that, I met Arlen from Backstage Capital and she wrote me a 25K check as our first money in. And I would say that was maybe the beginning. It, it wasn't my seed round, it was like a pre-seed. It's kind of like, you're not really doing enough revenue to do a seed, but like some people who just really believe in you as a founder wanna write you a check. And so Arlen did that. And that 25K actually helped us get to a million in revenue. And that million in revenue, basically was like a, it helped me, it helped get me on Shark Tank and then also get to my next seed round from Jeff. Lennon. Ah, stop <laughs> there because I left that out, Kim. I'm, it's terrible. I left that out that you 
So you get to this million dollar, many people don't know is that Kim was on, and her husband were on Shark Tank and they walked away from that. And, and will you be profitable? Year. Wow. Yes, we'll be cash flow positive in one month, in two months we'll be profitable. And we're projecting 180,000 in profits this year. We walked away from a $400,000 offer from Robert Herjavec uh, for 20% equity stake in our company because he was essentially valuing it at $2 million and we were already gonna make a million. So that, you know, that's, that's typically not how that works, especially when you're that early. That's why they call them sharks. <laughs> 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 right? To Very be able much. to get something at a lower cost. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but I know I, I left that out of the whole conversation. Your husband actually winning $100,000 on Who Wants to Millionaire, who be a millionaire, and then, you know, this whole going on shark taking, turning down the money, but but keep going. So you are you get the money from uh, Arlen at Backstage Capital, you raise, you, you get to a million dollars in revenues, then what? And then after we get to a million in revenue, the former CEO of LinkedIn, Jeff Winter, calls me up and says, hey, Kim, we want to invest a million dollars in your company. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Uh, and so took that deal and that helped propel us to that five million. And the first thing we did was that was, a, would that be considered seed capital or what would that be? That was my first price round. And it I consider okay. it my seed round. So okay. typically seed rounds are like your first official round and you are looking at, you know, one to $3 million, I would say. Um, most seeds, I feel like are well, one to five, honestly, depends on the company, one to five million. Um, I only raised a million at the time because I was trying to be really kind of cheap with my equity. Um, and I think it served us well now, but back then I probably should have raised a little bit more. So that million dollars, we the first thing we did was make our team W-2 employees because everyone was contractors. We didn't have any benefits or anything like that. Um, and then... Uh, we also invested in um, some merch and some um, advertising uh, in our manufacturing. We added like another unit in our building. We bought some materials to be able to produce in larger batches. Um, so yeah, we really invested in the business and that helped us meet the 5 million demand that we had. Uh, and then after that, I went out to fundraise and was just not having um, an easy time doing it, uh, just for all the doubt, honestly, from the investors. And so I was like, you know what? That's not the next, I spent the half of the year trying to fundraise and then the pandemic happened. And then thing, we were booming because um, all of e-commerce was booming during the pandemic. And then the following year I tried to fundraise again. And it was just more of a like a nope, nope, nope. And so I was like, you know what? I'll crowdfund. And at that time, two or three months before I decided to crowdfund, it was like January, I want to say. In March, the actual law was changing on March 15th to be able to allow you to raise up to five million in equity crowdfunding um, via regulation crowdfunding. And so this would have been, this to me is a bridge between my series A and my C. Series A is kind of like um, a real, like you're like a, a super official company. Uh, C, you know, some people still fail after the seed rounds of financing. So you could raise a million dollars, two, three million dollars in your seed and like go belly up as a company if you don't figure out how to actually make money. Series A, you usually have some solid revenues as a company and you're usually bringing in an institutional investor. So someone who has, you know, 200 million, 300 million um, on their books to invest in companies and they are going to send you through an audit, way more diligence. They're going to ask you for all your files. They want to know who, who's on your team. It's a much more serious round. And so that's what I'm going after in my next level of fundraising. But this crowdfund was really... The, uh, maybe uh, the more I should have raised for my seed and then just a little bit to hold me over. So what we use that money for, we use that money to uh, clear up any debts that we had. Um, we use that money to um, figure out, you know, to bring, you know, ads in house to um, uh, what else do we use that money for? I mean, <laughs> inflation is real and it's benefiting <laughs> us now. <laughs> <laughs> we, know, it, we know firsthand we used to buy a drum of grape seed oil for four thousand dollars now a drum of gra a drum is basically 55 gallons a drum of grape seed oil now might be like eight thousand dollars like literally raw materials have doubled in cost for us as a business and had we not crowdfunded i you know don't know what would have happened because the inflation is, is a real thing. Um, labor shortages are real, even for people who pay well. Um, there have been people who are, have come in and was like, you know, whew, they just walk off the job. Like literally just walk off. Like, <laughs> and that has happened to me, Deborah, more than like, more than five times. And I'm the, we're not like horrible people to work with, I promise you. You know, the person is just, 
they're just like, this is just, I don't, I don't ever want to do this. And they just like walk off. Uh, <laughs> trust me. I know that. <laughs> I know the feeling, you know, they're all excited and oh my gosh, this is amazing. I love what you're doing. And then like a three, you know, a week later, it's like, wow, this, <laughs> this is a lot, <laughs> right? Yes. If you're in a, if, if you're going to grow the business, no, I mean, this is just, uh, I, I think what you're saying is what people need to understand is when you crowdfund, when you are going for additional uh, funds in your business, isn't it? It is an investment. Yeah. And so your point is that you took that money and you invested it in, in the business so that then it could produce more and it could deliver more to your customer base. And, uh, you know, fascinating the just watching you. And, you know, I've been able to watch you from the time we met when you were had your little sample bottles to now. And um, and 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 so now you're saying you're preparing for you, you, to, to go after that other money. However, when we go when we come back, I want to go to our analyze, optimize, maximize segment. And Kim, in this next segment, I really want you to share with a with our audience if you knew then when I met you what you have learned from your experience, what would you tell other uh, entrepreneurs who maybe they are in that you know very very early stage where they're trying to figure out how to scale? What would you tell What would you tell them? So when we come back, it's our analyze, optimize, maximize segment. How can you ex- learn? from Kim's experience to accelerate your own business. America's Wealth Coach, and I'm, I hope you've been enjoying this conversation. Tim and Kim Lewis, the founders of Listener Brands, were able to start a business uh, from, from an idea, but certainly what we've learned is the importance of really listening to what your customers want and then giving it to them. That certainly has been the secret of success. They've raised uh, almost $5 million in equity crowdfunding and their businesses and expanded their brands. And now Kim Lewis, welcome back to Get Wealthy. I really uh, would love for you to share from this perspective, if you were to analyze what you what you have done now, what would you have d- done differently, uh, uh, first of all? And then second, uh, how could you have maximized it and now optimize as you're going forward. So I know that's, you know, just think, analyze, optimize, maximize. What would you, what do you know now that you didn't do that that could make, propel you even further? One of the things, I feel like there are three things I learned, right? My number one job as a CEO is to always be finding money. Whether that means making more money or raising more money or securing some kind of debt capital, um, or just figuring out all the ways. I feel like I know so many ways to get money now. Um, so many. <laughs> like I don't even know. There's a place. There's a website where you can uh, set the terms of your loan, 
And basically, just like you can crowdfund equity and you can crowdfund like rewards, you can crowdfund inventory. And they could have, you know, 7,000 people all loan you, you know, $100. And then now you've made up your loan and it has a certain payback period because it's a more guaranteed uh, return for that investor, right? And so, I, you know, that's the kind of example, it's an extreme example, but it's just like, I know lots of ways to make money now um, and to get money. And back then I was focused more so working in the business, sending the emails or sending the SMS or, you know, um, uh, making the product, just doing all the things in the business. But when you're so focused as an entrepreneur on doing things in the business and you're not thinking ahead, you're not planning for your team, you're not being a visionary and going out and getting money and meeting new people that will take your business to the next level, you are slowing your company down. Uh, it doesn't feel like it because we feel like, well, I'm working, I'm working the hardest than anybody else. And the easy thing for us to do as entrepreneurs is to work and to do because that is what comes naturally to us. The hard thing for us to do is to set a process up or a system in place, give it to our team and step away and let them be responsible for the result because we don't want them to fail. So we will, we would rather do it ourselves. But in doing that, you're missing the opportunity to go to this networking event and meet this billionaire. You're missing the opportunity to go pitch for Shark Tank. You're missing the opportunity to be a who wants to be millionaire. You're missing the opportunity to um, find out that there's a foundation willing to give you a loan. You know what I mean? For millions of dollars because you're not being the founder that you need to be to grow your company. So the first thing, my number one job is to get capital. My number two job is to hire great leaders, leaders who can then help you build your team so that you can, again, not be in the business or working on the business. One of the mistakes I made early on was just hiring people because they were available and I deeply needed help. And, and I was like, oh, you want to work here? You're excited. You're going to do blah, blah, blah. Great. Like, let's get you in tomorrow. And like, that was the worst mistake you can make. If you don't have an onboarding plan for them, if you don't have their like tasks and deliverables, the day they come in so they know what they're doing and they feel, you know, indoctrinated in the culture. Because I, I mean, there's people I've hired and I was just like, oh, you, how did you, you know, how did I like make that mistake? And so now I'm really good at hiring, but that's one of the things that comes with experience, right? Like you're good at it once you, you know, people say the first the thing in the interview that you're like, oh, that's a sign. Definitely should not hire them. In the beginning, though, you hire any and everybody because you just need help. So first thing, get capital. That's my number job. Second thing, hire great people. Third thing, put in great systems. Those are my only three jobs, and I should not be doing anything else. That means I should not be posting on Instagram. I should not be sending emails. I should not be um, DMing people, you know, back and forth with, you know, customers in the, in the DMs. I should not be commenting on all that, you know, as on Facebook. I should not be, and you know, and, and most people are like, oh my gosh, like she's talking to me. <laughs> I'm only saying this because that was me. <laughs> yeah. hey, well, well, what you really described is the shift from entrepreneur, right, to business owner, to CEO that you literally had to become someone different in order to scale uh, to the level that you, you have. And the one thing I want to say for you is full disclosure. I definitely invested in, in your equity uh, crowd, your crowdfunding uh, raise. And so did many of the members in our wealthy you, you're, you and you and Tim are such an inspiration uh, just to see the level of uh, complexity, right? Going from this one little thing to everything that you you have been able to accomplish. And I just have to say personally how excited I am and I can't wait to see what's next for you. So you say, I think I heard I, a, a little, eventually an IPO in the future for you. I would love that, Deborah. Um, I just, you know, it's funny. As I, I, I would love to IPO. There's only one black woman who's ever done it, Kathy Hughes, and she was technically the chairman of the board. So technically, there's been no black female CEO to take the company public, which is bonkers. Um, but when you don't know, but you think about the fact that women get less than three percent of venture capital, black women get less than a percent, and you know, then you know that makes it's more understandable how there's only <laughs> there hasn't been a CEO, a black woman CEO to take the company public. Um, I want to do it for my shareholders, for my people, for the culture, for my community. Um, but I do know that going public is going to cost you a good, like what, 15 million, probably at least. And then a few million a year in additional capital just to maintain 
the team that you need to go public, the accounting, the SEC director, the, all of the, the director that communicates with the SEC, um, internal communications, all the inventory management systems. It's just so much that's involved. Um, and that's why I want to raise my Series A for $20 million. I'm looking for a partner right now that would do that deal with me and that has an expertise in consumer products, is excited about us being direct-to-consumer um, until we hit $50 million, and wants to kind of ride off into the sunset with us. And I'm honestly thinking about profiting too, though, Deborah, because I feel like if I'm going to make somebody rich, you know, like it should be my people. So that is what I'm working no, on. No, I mean, and, and, and you bring up the, the fact is, and that this is what I want the audience to know, is in the work we do in Wealthy You, the, the, the people with the most assets literally participated in some type of uh, liquidity event. And so that liquidity event is when you are in very early stage. You invested in the, the early stage seed round where you have uh, taken the greatest risk. And then you, you that company goes public. And then you are now the recipient of the shares and can uh, of the company going public. And now you can have a liquidity event where and that's how you get wealthy. Kim, thanks so much for coming on Get Wealthy this uh, uh, for, for uh, this opportunity. Oh, thank you so much, Deborah, for having me. Yes, and it is my hope and my dream to give all of you guys and all of your investors a liquidity event, whether that be an acquisition or an IPO. I prefer an IPO, but if I get a great acquisition offer, I'm no fool, okay? Like, I need to return all my 7,000 investors a return on their money. <laughs> Yeah, let me just explain to you what that is. She could either go public or some amazing company can say, you know what, we just want to buy you. And so that also is a liquidity event and she, they have to pay off those early stage investors. So Kim Lewis, uh, co-founder of Listener Brands, thank you so much for coming on Get Wealthy and please give Tim Lewis, the other half, our regards. Will do. Thank you so much for having me, Deborah. Have a beautiful day. Thanks so much. Well, when we come back, the three takeaways from today's show that you need to know. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. You've learned a lot about what it means to scale a business, but you've also learned the ins and outs of scaling a business, of getting access to capital, of seed funding. We covered a lot, lot of ground, but here's the takeaway. First thing, and she said it, takes money to make money. She said her job was to find capital for the company. And that's what you need to understand if you're gonna scale your business. Secondly, it's not working in the business, it's working on the business. You have to become someone different if you want to go from that solopreneur to really that CEO. And then finally, it takes teamwork to make the dream work. It's not you being the talent, it's finding the talent to make your company grow. So that's gonna do it for us today. Thank you for watching Get Wealthy. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach.